reason that we have peace is because God is in control. It may not appear that way in the world. It may not appear that way when you listen to the news or read the news, but I assure you God is in control. He has everything in the palm of his hand. And as long as we acknowledge that God is in control, we have peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. In fact, Jesus said, in this world, I give you my peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. But he said, don't worry about it. Don't fret. Don't be discouraged. He said, I have overcome the world. I've overcome the very thing that brings trouble into this world. And so I just want you to realize this morning, just breathe in that peace today. Jesus said, not as the world gives. My peace. My peace. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you may be seated. It is appropriate, I think, that we would sing that song this morning with the message that I have to share with you. I want to encourage you, if you would, right now, to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. And while you're turning there, let me quickly just say that at Brazewood, we are a mask choice church. That is, whatever you feel comfortable with. I read an article last night that said that in many churches, wearing or not wearing masks has caused splits in the church. Can you believe that? That's the most amazing, that's the most fleshly thing I've ever read in my life. That masks of all things would split churches. But we're not a church of split, we're a church of unity in the spirit. And, and there are many reasons, let me just... Let me just say, there are many reasons why a person might wear a mask. We never know a person's physical well-being or the challenges that they may be facing. And so there is no judgment in this church at all. How in the world can I judge somebody? If I were to judge somebody based upon the decisions they've made, there are five people that can judge me based on the decisions that I make in my life. So I just want you to know, if you're wearing your mask, be at peace. If you're not wearing your mask, be at peace. We are people of peace. Amen? Amen. I welcome you to Brazewood this morning. So glad that you've joined in, cho chosen to join with us here on campus or online. And I want you to remember that above all things, we are called to soar. We are not limited by what takes place in this world. We're not limited by what we see in this world. And I want you, if you would, to heed my instruction to you this morning. Do not allow anyone or anything to hold you back from your appointed destiny. Don't allow anyone to tell you what you cannot do. Don't allow anyone to tell you who you are or to define who you are. Let God do that work. God determines our today and God determines our tomorrow as well. And I want to encourage you, remain focused on your destination. And especially with everything that we're seeing today, focus on your destination. Because your destination gives purpose to the journey. Your destination gives purpose to the life that you live today and that you'll live in the future. And I, I just want to say I am so blessed with those of you that have chosen to worship with us here at Brazewood. You've chosen for Brazewood to be your church home. I'm so glad we see so many new faces here at Brazewood, and that is a blessing both here at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock worship service. It's a blessing to see those that God has engrafted into this body, into the kingdom of God here at Brazewood. And, and I also want to encourage you with these words. Somebody that you know needs Jesus in their life. Somebody that you know needs to be encouraged in their life. And the word that the Lord spoke into my heart and I share with you this morning is, if you invite a friend to Brazewood, if they visit, they will meet Jesus. They will. Because we're not here to exalt a man we're not here to exalt denomination or religion. We are here to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw. He will draw. The Spirit will draw all men to him, not to us, not to a church, but to him and be glorified. And so I want to encourage you to share with somebody that's discouraged. Now, if they have a church home, my word to you this morning is leave them alone. We're not trying to steal sheep. We're not thieves in this church. We're not stealing sheep. We are out to do what Jesus did, and that is to seek and save those that are lost, those that have lost their way, and help them, bring them to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 
My message this morning is an address to some very important issues. Having soaring faith in uncertain times. This is what the Lord has spoken to me. We're deviating a little bit from the series that we were in a, uh, in the weeks past. The Holy Spirit spoke into my heart as I was meditating. In fact, I was in the middle of preparing another message, and the Holy Spirit prompted me to change the message this morning. And, and I want to encourage you that in uncertain times, we still have a soaring faith. Because our faith is not in man. Our faith is not in government. Our faith is not in the UN. Our faith is not in NATO. Our faith is in Jesus. And when times are uncertain, when things are difficult, we ought to turn with great passion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's, I think, so vital and important in our life. Many are asking today, and I've read many articles that have indicated or asked the question, is this the end? Is this the end? And I want to address this this morning. But before I do, I have a word for you. I think it's important to lay a foundation. Lest we become fearful. Lest we become overly concerned in one direction. And here's what I want to share. I want to share with you Psalms chapter 118. Turn there in your Bible. Hold the text that we have this morning. But turn in your Bible. Psalms 118. I want to read three verses. Verse 14, 15, and 16. From the Living Bible. And I believe this is what God is saying to us this morning. This is not just a general word. I think sometimes we can read the Bible and think of it in terms of, of great generalities. But this is a word I believe that the Spirit is speaking into each and every one of our hearts this morning. I believe that God were standing here this morning, he would want to say this to you, is what the Bible says. He is your strength and your song in the heat of battle and now he has given you victory. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know what the outcome of this battle in the Ukraine will be. I don't know. But I do know this. God gives us victory. I said God gives us victory. Songs of joy at the news of your rescue are sung in the homes of the godly. And listen to this. The strong arms of the Lord has done glorious things. I can testify in my life, God has done miraculous things for me. God has guided, directed, and even in the throes of a spiritual battle, God has whispered in my ear, whispered in my spirit, be of good courage, I have everything under control. I may not have it under control, but God has everything under control. And God has a designed destiny for each and every one of us. And the destiny that he's called us to is not contingent on the things that are happening in the world. Pray you get that in your spirit this morning. What's happening in the world, the, the, the confusion, the turmoil that's happening in the world does not separate you from the destiny that God has called you to. We perhaps weren't prepared for what's going on today, but God knew it was coming. And God always has a plan. In the most difficult times, in the darkest of night, God has a plan. God has designed your destiny, and he's leading you and guiding you to that destiny. And my word to you this morning is trust God. Trust him. You, you have put your life in God's hands. You have put your life, and, and brother and sister, if we can trust God for our eternal destiny, we can trust him for every day's destiny. If you can trust, if you've placed your life in God's hands and you've trusted him that he's going to carry you through to your eternal reward, your eternal destination, you can trust him that he's going to get you through every day that you will face in your life. Trust him. He will carry you through. We're now coming through one of the most challenging times that we've faced in, a, in about 60 years, the pandemic, most challenging times of our family, of our life, of our church, and of our nation. In fact, in some way, COVID-19 has affected all of us. If not physically, then certainly emotionally and spiritually. But through it all, through it all, God has been faithful. I testify to you this morning. Through it all, God has been faithful. Many of us in our 
families have been touched by family members that contracted COVID. And, and quite frankly and candidly, there have been some that have been called home to their eternal reward as a result of COVID-19. But I'm going to tell you something. It wasn't COVID-19 that took their life. It was God who called them home. Because death is not a defeat, my friend. We're not defeated when we die. In fact, the greatest victory we will experience in life is when we pass over from this threshold into our eternal reward with our Heavenly Father. I believe that with all my heart. Psalms chapter 33, verse 4 says, The word of the Lord is upright, and all the work that he has done has been faithful. Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear to be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And I would say it this way, for it is the Lord God who has gone with you and who has not left you or forsaken you. Then on the heels of what we've just come through, we we thought we could breathe a a breath of fresh air. We could could relax and enjoy. And right on the heels of COVID-19, boom, we had a not a threat of war, we're right in the midst of war. And on top of that, we're fl- facing inflation in a way that we've not seen in over 40 years. Gas prices are increased, though I might give you some encouragement this morning. I passed by a gas station and the price went down 20 cents. <laughs> There's always hope. <laughs> and for those of you that work in the oil industry, thank you very much for that. We appreciate it but also facing supply chain shortages as well. We, we, it seems like we end one thing and two more things are added in. So much going on in the world today, so much which is concerning, but we face these uncertain times with hope. Believers, without Jesus, I don't know how I would be looking at the times that we're facing today. I don't know what my emotional life would be like. I don't know what my state of mind would be like if I didn't have Jesus in my life. Where do you turn if you don't have Jesus? Where where would you turn if you don't have hope? Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 in the message version says, Jerusalem will be told. And when you see Jerusalem in the New Testament, you can know that it's the believer that God is talking to. Not just a city not just the inhabitants of a city, but it's believers that God is speaking to. So he would say, you have been told, don't be afraid and don't despair. Your God is present among you. Strong, a strong warrior, and he is there to save you. Psalms 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots, and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. The New Living Translation says, some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. In other words, we brag about our God. We brag about what our God can do. We brag about what our God, who our God is. But more than just bragging, our God is on display in our lives. We display the glory of the Lord in our life every day, not just in this building, Not just when we come together as the body of Christ, but in our maximum impact environment, we are the display of the glory of God. We are the display of the presence of the Lord, of the reality of the Lord our God. We boast. Some will boast in their military might. Some nations will boast in their military leaders. But brother and sister, we boast in the name of the Lord. He is the one who will bring victory to us. And we boast, we display the victory of God. But frankly, we are in very difficult times, very unsettling times, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with an unknown end game. We don't know where it will end. The showdown with the United States and Europe, the death of innocent civilians, men, women, and children, That's the devastation of war, my friend. It's not the missiles and the bombs or the bullets. It's how it affects citizens of the country. With China pursuing Taiwan, USA Today said, 
New provocative language from Beijing comes amid heightened tensions in the region and new fears from the U.S. military about China's willingness to invade the nation island. And with what is happening in Russia, I just read this morning that China is standing up for Russia. With Iran issuing threats against the United States and Israel, December 15th of 2021, Iran's state-affiliated Tehran Times issued a threat to Israel on Wednesday, publishing a map of the country riddled with markers as a reminder that Iranian forces can ostensibly strike anywhere they want to strike. March 13th of this year, Iran has claimed responsibility for a missile barrage that struck near a sprawling U.S. consulate complex. With North Korea's unstable leader, Kim Jong-un, pursuing nuclear weapons, in fact, they have announced they've already, they already have thermonuclear weapons. And not only that, but in 2017, North Korea says that it has successfully tested nuclear weapons that could be loaded on a long-range missile. But not just nations far away in our own backyard. Mexico citizens are disappearing, and the murder rate is alarming. According to New York, New York Times, Mexico is nearing a grim milestone of 100,000 disappeared people, according to Mexico's National Search Commission. They're finding mass graves this month, mass graves of where the cartel has literally slaughtered hundreds, if not thousands, of people. In a country racked by a drug war without end, death can feel pervasive. Murder rates climbed now topping 30,000 a year. Macabre images of bodies strung up on bridges or tossed on roadsides as warnings appear on the newscast, and torture techniques now, tor techniques now have nicknames. This is in our own backyard. And my friends, what I have just suggested to you is just the short list. This is not everything that's happening in our world. And it seems as though the circumstances are changing daily. It gets to a point, frankly, where I don't like watching the news so much anymore. I can watch it for a little while, and then I have to turn it the station or stop reading because it's just overwhelming with everything that you see. And the question is, and I think on many people's mind today, is the war with Russia and Ukraine the beginning of the end? Will we see World War III? made notes here to myself, I've not heard so much talk about World War III since October of 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis. In fact, the comment or the statement World War III is now almost a common statement. Will the prices of oil trigger an economic tsunami? But I think the real question to a lot of believers today is, will the rapture take place now? There's so many questions but I have a definitive word for you. Will the rapture take place? I have a definitive word. I don't know. I really don't know. But today I'd like to begin a short series that will only be interrupted by our business meeting next Sunday at 10 o'clock. And I want you to read the text with me, if you would, Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 through 14. I'm going to make a few comments this morning with the amount of time that I have. And what I'm not able to make this morning, I will pick up the 1st of April. Matthew 24, verse 4 through 14 is, is Jesus answering a question, a question about the end of time. It, it's always been on the mind since the resurrection of Jesus. It's always been on the mind of believers. When will Jesus come back? In fact, now there's a lot of thought that the rapture will never take place. In fact, Many Christians, I say many, some Christians believe the talking about the end times has already taken place. I read one article where a, um, a Christian, I say that loosely, theologian, has said that we are now living in the millennium. If this is the millennium, God help us all. <laughs> truly, truly. How, how ridiculous. But there are some that believe that after the first century church, after the destruction of the temple, that was the end times that Jesus was speaking about. I think, I think you have a little, in, in fact, I have a little struggle with that thought, considering Jesus, the angel said, as Jesus said, you will see this Savior come back the same way you've seen him go. And I don't think see, humanity has seen the coming of Jesus yet. 
So with that in mind, let's read our text. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 through 14, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Jesus answered their question, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. And let me just tell you, that's not just those that say they're coming or that they are the Messiah. That's not those saying, I am the Messiah. That also speaks of those who claim to speak for the Messiah, to, to claim to have revelation from the Messiah. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that, it, that you are not alarmed. For such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And by the way, there was a major earthquake that happened in Japan just this week, last week. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. Underline that. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. Verse 9. And then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will, the love of most, the King James Version, many will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Hallelujah for that hope. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in, in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Well, Pastor, is this the beginning of the end? Well, I will express to you this morning that we are closer to the end today than we were 100 years ago. We're closer to the end today than we were 50 years ago. We're closer to the end of times than we were 10 years ago than we were five minutes ago. Verse 7 says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all of these things are the beginning of birth pains. And I know that someone would quickly say, rightfully so, that as long as humanity has existed, there have been wars and rumors of wars. But I have a word for you today. When in the history of humanity has the threat of war brought the possibility of human annihilation? But remember, Jesus said and spoke of birthing pains. Do you know, and those of you that have had children, uh, that would only be ladies, not the men, know that birthing pains get shorter and shorter and more and more intense as the birth arises. And we're seeing that happen today. More, not only more of what we hear, more of rumor, wars and rumors of war, but the more intensity of those wars and rumors. So the question then becomes, I think, and this is where I want to launch this morning and get as far as we can, what should we do in response to what we see? What should the church, or how should the church respond? And I think the first is the most important, and that is, it is imperative that we seek community. That sounds so trite. And Pastor Steve, with everything else, isn't there more we can do? Well, certainly there is, and we will discuss and talk about that at a later date. But right now, what is important is that we seek community. This is not the time. Hear me. I, I will tell you this morning, this is the revelation God has brought into my heart. This is not the time to isolate. This is not the time for the church to isolate. This is a time for community. This is a time for us to be together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Again, the birthing pains become more and more intense as the birth date approaches. It becomes more and more. This, this propensity to isolate oneself is not new. It happened in the first century, and it has increased exponentially to this day as well. Uh, some of it has happened because of the circumstances that we have no control over. 
COVID-19 created the necessity of isolating for a period of time. In fact, you remember we were closed as a church for three months. Who would have thought that would ever happen? Certainly not my family. We, <laughs> in the banning DNA, if there were hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and pestilence, we were going to find our way to church. But for three months. But that didn't keep us from meeting together, though in a different venue. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says, Two people are better off than one. Two people are better off than one. For they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But the person who falls alone is in real trouble. Again, spoken many, many eons of time before today. And it's just as true today as it was the day this word was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit. As we see the time approaching, the natural propensity of the flesh will be to isolate, to take care of number one. But there's a real problem with that. Corey Ten Boom, who lived through the Holocaust, she said this, when a Christian shuns fellowship with other Christians, the devil smiles. When Christians stop studying the Bible, the devil laughs. When Christians stop praying, the devil shouts for joy. And all of these things, again, are a part of the propensity of the flesh when times get tough. My brother and sister, when times get difficult, these three things ought to be a primary part of our life, not a, an adjunct not an option, but it ought to be primary to our life. In fact, when we see these things approaching, we ought to press in, not press out. We ought, to, we ought to, the disciplines of our faith ought to be more important to us during the times of struggle, struggle and difficulty than any other time. They're always important. Any time is important, but especially when we're going through difficulty. Christian community is vital to our faith. I'm not talking about to the church. It is that. I'm not talking about vital to religion or denomination. I'm talking about community is vital to our faith, vital to our spiritual life. It's not an option, my friend. A common term, as we have discussed in the past for community, is the word fellowship. But fellowship has really lost its meaning in today's Christian vernacular because we call everything fellowship. We call eating a meal fellowship. We call playing games fellowship. We, we, there's just so much. We, we have a fellowship hall. I mean, the word fellowship has lost it, at least its biblical context of the importance. The word fellowship is derived from the Greek word koinonia, and that is a strong word. It's not a common word like fellowship. Koinonia is a strong Greek word which means to hold something in common. Can I tell you the glue that holds the church together is our faith. That's what holds us together. Not the name of a church, not the person who pastors the church, not the calling of the denomination. What holds us together, the glue that holds the body together is Jesus Christ. What we hold in common. And that's not just to say one church. That's to say everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. There are things that we do not hold in common. There are certain denominational traditions, tr denominational uh, thoughts that we don't hold in common. But the one thing we do hold in common ought to be the glue that keeps us together. You talk about gorilla glue. This is Holy Spirit glue, and that is Jesus Christ. <laughs> holding us together, melding us together, cementing us together. It's a, it's a powerful term. It's used 20 times in the New Testament. You want to know if something is important, how many times is it used in the Word of God, and especially in the New Testament. The early church recognized the power of koinonia, the power of what held them together. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Acts that they broke bread and ate in each other's uh, homes, and they prayed together. In other words, they were glued together. In fact, so glued were they. So connected were they that when one member of the body suffered, the body would rally around that person. Let me ask you a question. 
If you isolate, who's going to rally around you? If you're on your own, if you're navigating by yourself, who is it that will lift you up when you fall? Who is it that will be there to encourage you? You're there by yourself. And you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. Koinonia describes the unity of the Spirit that comes when we share faith together, comes when we share conviction together, and shares when we, come, when we share vision together. Now I'm just about out of time, but I'm going to introduce the first point. I'm not going to get through it this morning, but let me just introduce it nonetheless. The benefits of community are many. But a primary benefit is it gives us a vision for the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God is not one man. The kingdom of God isn't made up of just the pastor. The kingdom of God isn't just made up of the worship leader. The kingdom of God isn't just made up of the deacons. The kingdom of God God is made up of every believer. In fact, the Bible says it is God that puts the body together. And every, hear me, every member of that body has a function. I'll say it another way. Every member of that body has a purpose and a plan. If God has connected you to Brazewood, whether you're on campus or online this morning, if God has connected you to Brazewood body, you have a function and a purpose. Matthew chapter 15, verse, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, in the same way, you should be the light for other people. Live so that they will see the good works or the good things that you do and they will praise your Father in heaven. And we often think of that, and rightfully so, as the light outside of the church. But let me tell you something. When you live for Christ, when you display the glory of the Lord, when you show forth forth the works of Christ in your life, not only do you display the light of Christ to those outside of the church, you also display the light of Christ inside the church as well. That we are an encouragement to one another. That we lift one another up in faith. This is why I think it's it's so important that when we come into church, it's not just, hi, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Everything's okay. But that we are vulnerable enough with one another. We trust one another enough in the body of Christ that we can say, I'm not doing very well. And when we hear that, we don't use that as a function of gossip, but rather that becomes our point of prayer, our point of intercession. I want to jump quickly, and this will be the end of my message this morning. And I'll come back to it next two weeks from now. But ultimately, our community is also evangelism. Francis Schaeffer said, I re- hear this, our relationship with each other is the criteria the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. How we treat one another as believers, how we relate to one another as believers determines the authenticity of of our message to those that are watching our lives. You are, a, you are a television set in the world, and people are tuned in to your channel. They're watching us, and how we relate to one another. This is why I don't criticize pastors and teachers, evangelists and missionaries and denominations and churches. I don't criticize them because that's not my business. That's God's business. And if I have a disagreement in some way, two things, I keep it to myself. And when I'm not keeping it to myself, it's me and the Father talking about it. And sometimes, I want to tell you, sometimes my Heavenly Father says, Son, it's none of your business. It's none of your business. He doesn't validate or invalidate. He just says, let me deal with it. And I release it to the Lord. But let me tell you something. There may be somebody praying about me too. And God's going to say to them, it's none of your business. But God will deal with our heart together. The impact of the community or the sense of community is not just seen in the church. It is that, but it's more than that. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, The Son of Man came to seek to find lost people and save them. You've heard the saying, The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for the saints. Say that again. The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for the saints. The church is not a select circle of the immaculate, the perfect, but a home where outcasts can come and find hope. And if you feel so high and mighty that you don't need anybody, 
If you feel so holy, I've got a word for you. Remember who you were. I got a word for you. Remember who you are now, defined by Jesus Christ. But here's the most important thing. Remember who it was that changed your life. Primary function of the church is community. Brother and sister, if we can't find community with one another and we are believers together, imperfect. No one perfect in this house. And I just got to tell you, if you were perfect... Well, first of all, if you think you're perfect, we need prayer real quick. <laughs> R- truly, truly. I don't think any of us hold ourselves up to that kind of standard of perfection. Just sometimes we think we're more perfect than other people. We're not. We're not. The only, thing that, the, di- the only difference between me and the worst sinner that walks on the face of the earth, some of you might think that's Vladimir Putin right now. The only difference between me and Putin is Jesus Christ. It's the only difference. Every one of us in this sanctuary are capable of sin. And the only thing that keeps us from that is the grace and the mercy of God. And as we come together, my brother and sister, as we come together, we don't just come together to have church. It's not just a tradition. If, if that's all there is, there's no hope here. If that's all there is, there are no answers here. If it's just to perpetuate an organization, we've got nothing to offer anybody. Perpetuate people who love fleas. But we're here to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. And we are here to open our hearts, open our lives to one another first, but then to people outside. Listen, if we can't find unity in the church, God's not going to bring people into this building to experience disunity. God will find a place where the body has a heart and a hunger and a thirst for Jesus Christ, and that's where the Spirit will draw them. But my brother and sister, I think this is a place where people can find Jesus. And I want to encourage you in this as I close. I want to encourage you in this. Community is intentional. Community is intentional. Koinonia, a strong Greek word. Not a casual thing. Community is intentional. It doesn't just happen. You have to work at it. It has to be a priority in our lives, which also means that we have to be about encouraging one another. You walk around, follow me around, you'll find enough to criticize me about, I'm sure. But I don't need criticism, my friend. I need encouragement. I, I, need, I need somebody to come alongside me and say, Pastor, let's walk together. I've, I've said that was the end, so I'm going to leave it there. We'll pick this up again. I, I, haven't, I haven't exhausted this part of it, but, but I'll leave you with these words. It is absolutely intentional. Amen? Yes. Well, with that, it's time to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. Can I hear a hallelujah? hallelujah? Now, for those of you that are guests and visitors here this morning, you're not obligated to give in this offering.